talk about Winston Churchill, a towering figure of 20th century history, and about his legacy in our own time. During this often cynical era, when the reputations of once towering figures are routinely debunked and discredited, Winston Churchill is still held in high regard. He's widely honored as a man of righteous defiance, a courageous voice against evil, honored as the great British bulldog who, during the dark years of World War II, defied the might of Hitler and Nazi Germany and led his nation to victory against evil and tyranny. That's more or less the official prevailing image of this extraordinary man, who is virtually an icon or totem of the establishment view of the 20th century. He's praised by many American writers in our own time. Uh, one of them is Charles Krauthammer, a widely read columnist for the Washington Post and a fervent Jewish neocon apologist for Israel. Several years ago, Krauthammer wrote that Churchill is the only possible individual to be regarded as person of the century, of the 20th century. And he explained, take away Churchill in 1940, and Britain would have settled with Hitler or worse. Nazism would have prevailed. Hitler would have achieved what no other tyrant, not even Napoleon, had ever achieved, mastery of Europe. Henry Kissinger has called Churchill the quintessential hero. British-American writer Christopher Hitchens has written of Churchill, his titanic standing depends principally on a set of rotundly defiant speeches made in the years 1940 and 41 when he staked everything on resistance to Hitler. For innumerable readers and reviewers on both sides of the Atlantic, Arthur Schlesinger prominent among them, the iconic status of Churchill is an indispensable fact of life. If it can be shown that he was a vain old fool, then their world would turn upside down. It's difficult not to be impressed or even dazzled by Churchill's colorful personality, in comparison with which most political leaders of the past 100 years seem pale midgets. Churchill was often exasperating, sometimes callous, a man of many prejudices, but he was also a man of quick wit, puckish humor, enormous energy, and arresting eloquence. Irving said of him at an IHR uh, conference some years ago, Churchill was a magnificent man, a wonderful writer, a brilliant speaker. Writing at his worst, he was better than most of us other writers, writing flat out at our best. I've said it often before, and it's undoubtedly true, he had a habit of finding a cutting phrase. Well, Churchill's reputation is due in large measure to his own successful efforts at self-promotion. Above all, in a six-volume history of the great conflict he wrote entitled The Second World War, almost uh, 4,500 pages altogether, and it's still uh, widely consulted and was enormously influential when it came out several years after the end of World War II. Contributing not insignificantly to the durability of Churchill's reputation was his lifelong philo-Semitism. Throughout his career, Churchill was an ardent booster of Jewish and Zionist interests. He once wrote that Jews are, as he put it, the most formidable and most remarkable race which has ever appeared in the world. In the words of British historian Andrew Roberts, Churchill felt an instinctive affinity for their genius as well as a historian's respect for their trials, and he supported Jewish aspirations wherever they did not clash with those of the empire. He may have inherited this philo-Semitism from his father, but he certainly gave it a new luster in his own life. His sympathy and support for Jewish interests is also the subject of a book by Martin Gilbert, the Jewish historian, who devoted an entire book to this subject entitled Churchill and the Jews, published in 2007. It's interesting, by the way, that in his six-volume history, The Second World War, Churchill made only passing reference to what is now called the Holocaust, wartime Germany's harshly anti-Jewish policies. And interestingly enough, there is 
no mention whatsoever in Churchill's six-volume history of gas chambers or of gassing. In recent years, though, there has been more critical voices uh, raised about Churchill and his legacy, and contributing to the increasingly critical view, even among scholars of Churchill, has been the works of the British historian John Charmley. His 1993 book, Churchill, The End of Glory, was uh, widely commented at the time and criticized for being so harshly critical of Winston Churchill. And Charmley and other writers since then have added to this with additional scholarly works delving into and dissecting Churchill and his legacy. Also contributing to this process has been British historian David Irving. He has completed and published two volumes of a three-volume work entitled Churchill's War. Volume two alone is a powerful blow against Churchill's well-manicured image as the heroic figure who saved Britain and Western civilization. This well-entrenched idealization of Churchill is part and parcel of a drastically misleading view of the Second World War that Americans in particular have been fed for decades. One common deceit is to give the impression that Hitler sought war against Britain and France, that he wanted to conquer Britain and France. Indeed, Americans are told that Hitler wanted to conquer the world. The impression is given that Hitler and Germany aggressively attack Britain and France. But what is routinely suppressed is the key fact that Hitler strenuously sought to avoid conflict with Britain and France, and that it was those two countries that declared war against Germany. In fact, as David Irving has pointed out, Britain was the one country of which Hitler consistently spoke favorably. From 1918 to the day of his suicide in 1945, Hitler avowed that his one ambition had been to work in unison, even in grand alliance with Britain and its empire. And Irving adds, there is nothing to be found in the archives to contradict our view that Hitler was sincere in this view. Churchill's enduringly stellar image is all the more remarkable considering that his views on a wide range of issues were, by today's standards, hopelessly backward and politically incorrect. Churchill, for example, was a strong and seemingly sincere supporter of the British Empire. In fact, uh, even though most ardent supporters of Churchill's legacy have difficulty squaring their admiration for him with the fact that Churchill was uh, consistently opposed to independence for India and even uh, opposed to dominion status for India within the British Empire. In November 1942, Churchill declared, let me however make this clear in case there should be any mistake about it in any quarter. We mean to hold our own. I have not become the king's first minister in order to preside over the liquidation of the British Empire. Along with most Britons and Americans of his era, Churchill was also an unabashed racist. He dismissed blacks as niggers and blackamoors. He regarded Arabs as worthless. He called Chinese chinks or pigtails. He called dark races baboons or hottentots. At one time he referred to the people of India as the beastliest people in the world next to the Germans. He was in favor of white supremacy in Britain and wanted English-speaking whites, of whom he was not ashamed to proclaim as a superior breed, to rule the entire world. During a luncheon at the White House during the war years, he openly said, we are superior, referring to English-speaking white people. Present at the luncheon was Vice President Henry Wallace, who responded sarcastically, so you believe in the pure Anglo-Saxon race, Anglo-Saxondom über alles. Although Churchill's harshly anti-Hitler rhetoric is well known in 1939, 1940, and during the war years, as late as 1937, he was still saying complimentary 
things about the German leader. In his book, uh, Great Contemporaries, which came out in 1937, he extolled Hitler's patriotic ardor and love of country. The story of Hitler's struggle, Churchill went on, and I'm quoting, cannot be read without admiration for the courage, the perseverance, and the vital force which enabled him to challenge, defy, conciliate, or overcome all the authorities or resistance which barred his path. In another publication from that same year, Churchill wrote, one may dislike Hitler's system and yet admire his patriotic achievement. If our country were defeated, I hope we should find a champion as indomitable to restore our courage and lead us back to our place among the nations. Churchill is often praised for his outspoken criticism of his government's policy in 1938 and 1939 of appeasement of Hitler and Third Reich Germany. In the Parliament, Churchill's voice was nearly the only one raised against the policy of Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain for Chamberlain's short-lived effort to accommodate Hitler's demands for self-determination for ethnic Germans living in what was then Czechoslovakia and by extension accepting German hegemony in Central and Eastern Europe. But when Churchill himself held power as Prime Minister, he carried out a policy of appeasement far surpassing that of his predecessor. But the foreign leader that Churchill and also Franklin Roosevelt appeased was not Hitler, but rather the Soviet Premier Stalin, a dictator who, by any measure, was a far more ruthless ruler than Hitler, and whose victims, by all accounts, vastly outnumber those of the German leader. Churchill not only cynically sanctioned Stalin's brutal hegemony over Central and Eastern Europe, helping them dispose of the fates of many millions of people against their will, Churchill also collaborated with the Soviet ruler on issues of military strategy. It's no exaggeration to say that, certainly in modern British history, the most important ally of Britain during the most important conflict in history, World War II, was the Soviet Union and its dictatorial leader, Joseph Stalin. By the late 1930s, by 1938, 1939, Churchill's stature and career depended on war. This is an important point because without war, Churchill would have been remembered in history as a second-rate figure in the history of his country. It's important to remember that although he was an important wartime leader, he had very little broad popular appeal and was especially distrusted by the working class in Britain, the great majority of the population. In 1945, elections were held, the first elections testing Churchill's leadership. This was held before World War II had ended in Asia, that is the war with Japan, but after the end of the war, end of fighting in Europe. The result was a disastrous a setback and defeat, repudiation of Churchill and of the Conservative Party. And Churchill and his party was replaced uh, in 1945 by the Labour Party of Clement Attlee. Churchill's lack of popularity or of love of the by the British working class was underscored by Churchill's uh, upper class lifestyle and his origins. Never in his lifetime did Churchill ever ride public transportation. He never once took a ride on the London subway. Throughout his lifetime, Churchill never had to buy his own groceries. He was a man very much out of step, out of sync with the life and travails and difficulties and day-to-day -day concerns and worries of the vast majority of the English people. Emphasizing the importance of war in his career, uh, Churchill was the voice that spoke out repeatedly against any form of accommodation with Hitler and his government during the years of 1938 and 1940. In 1939, when Britain declared war against Germany, uh, Churchill was given a position in the British cabinet and government 
as First Lord of the Admiralty, that is, head of the British Navy. And ironically, it was his own disastrous mistake as head of the British Navy in 1940 that resulted in him coming to power as Prime Minister. And that was his role with the disastrous Norway campaign in 1940. He arranged for and pushed for a British policy to mine Norway's waters so that Norway would not have trade with Germany, even though Norway was a neutral country as along with Sweden. Churchill also, in, co in collaboration with the French, prepared for an invasion of Norway by British troops. The Germans anticipated Churchill's efforts and themselves attacked uh, and invaded Norway and Denmark just a few days ahead of the British campaign to take over those countries. The American historian Joseph Lash, in a work of history about Churchill and Roosevelt, wrote, The Norwegian fiasco that finally toppled Chamberlain was Churchill's invention, insisted on by him in the face of the waverings of other, other cabinet ministers and guided by him as head of the Admiralty in its day-to-day -day operations. He was as deeply involved in Norway as he had been in Gallipoli, that is, during World War I. But while the latter led to political exile, Norway brought him to the pinnacle of power. So although the Norwegian campaign was a fiasco, and it was Churchill's own campaign, the blame for the fiasco was pinned on the Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain, and Churchill emerged as uh, the hero of the moment, and then replaced Chamberlain in May 1940 as Prime Minister. But again, uh, during this period and throughout the war years, Churchill's stature and his position as the Prime Minister of Britain depended on the continuation of war to the end. Churchill's lack of uh, feeling for or uh, connection with the vast majority of the British public uh, is also a suppressed aspect of his uh, legacy and his image. Alexander Coburn is an author and columnist who was born in Britain in June 1941. He uh, was a co-founder of the Counterpunch website and is a very prolific writer. In an essay he uh, wrote that was published uh, some years ago, he took a look at the myth of Britain's so-called finest hour, that is during 1939-1941. Alexander Coburn wrote, there's a myth now about the British hanging together in those dark days, that is of 1939-41. London can take it, Ed Morrow told America in his CBS broadcasts. Actually, Coburn says, morale was appalling. Most people, correctly, had little confidence in the competence of their government and thought Germany was going to win. In the Channel Islands, which the Nazis did take over, the people greeted them hospitably and turned in Jews with zest. The British Ministry of Information employed 10,000 people to read people's mail surreptitiously, intercepting about 200,000 letters a week and discovered that British people were deeply pessimistic and thought Churchill was played out. A secret government report spelled out the popular lack of ner nerve. And I'm quoting from one of these reports, Portsmouth, on all sides we hear that looting and wanton destruction has reached alarming proportions. The police seem unable to exercise control. The effect on morale is bad, and there is a growing feeling of desperation. Their nerve had gone. Churchill's famous speeches about their finest hour and so forth, Coburn goes on, didn't have much effect either. Most people tried to shut out the war as much as they could. By the end of 1940, nearly a third of the British population admitted to not following news of the war. When asked what depressed them most, people put the weather first, then war news, then the air raids. Life was rotten anyway, 
for a huge slab of the population which was malnourished, poorly housed, barely educated, and deeply discontented. When the King and Queen of England visited the London East End, they were soundly booed. In the summer of 1941, an English woman got five years in prison for saying, Hitler is a good man, a better man than Mr. Churchill. It's important to remember that Britain declared war against Germany in 1939, supposedly to, protect, to protest German violation of Poland's sovereignty and integrity. Supposedly, Britain was so altruistic and noble that it went to war simply to uphold the principle of freedom and independence. This myth was recently uh, repeated in the much-praised motion picture, The King's Speech, where uh, the actor reads the speech given by the king declaring uh, war or announcing Britain's war against Germany in 1939 and giving the impression that Britain w had declared war on Germany for the highest and most altruistic of motives. But in fact, what Churchill demanded of the Poles during the course of the war, and together with what he and Stalin imposed on Poland, was far worse, far more brutal than what Hitler had demanded in 1939. In 1939, Hitler had demanded the return of the German city of Danzig to the German Reich, a city that had been torn away from Germany in the aftermath of World War won through the Treaty of Versailles. Um, the return of Danzig to the German Reich was in accord with the uh, desire and wish of the vast, overwhelming majority of the people of this city-state of Danzig. But Poland absolutely refused to consider this and regarded any change in the status of Danzig as a reason for war. But what Churchill did during World War II in 1944, 1945, was far, far more brutal than anything Hitler had demanded of Poland in 1939. In the words of John Charmley, the British historian in his book, Churchill's Grand Alliance, published in 1995, and I'm quoting, Churchill was brutal with the Poles. He told the British, uh, the Polish Prime Minister, that the three great powers, that is, Britain, America, and the Soviet Union, who had expended their blood and treasure in order to liberate Poland for the second time in a generation, were entitled to insist that a matter of domestic concern to the Poles should not, allow, should not be allowed to become the cause of friction among them. He became so infuriated with the Polish leaders, the government, he had supported in 1939, he said, I wash my hands off. As far as I'm concerned, we shall give the business up. Because of quarrels between Poles, we are not going to wreck the peace of Europe. And he threatened them. He said, the Russians will sweep through your country and your people will be liquidated. You are on the verge of annihilation. He was demanding that Poland agree to the turning over of half or enormous part of Poland's territory to the Soviet Union and ultimately to Poland being dominated by uh, the dictator Joseph Stalin. In response to a refusal by the Polish Prime Minister to accept Churchill's demand of a new boundary that would mean the turning over of vast amounts of Polish uh, territory to the Soviet Union, Churchill railed you are no government if you are incapable of taking any decision. You are callous people who want to wreck Europe. I shall leave you to your own troubles. He accused the Polish leader of cowardice, which is really an extraordinarily uh, callous thing himself to say. And as Charmley comments, this is where Churchill's policy had brought him, to telling the Poles that if they did not accept an ultimatum, they would be massacred. They had known that well enough in 1939, and it was rather hard after that experience to expect them to place much reliance on a British guarantee. Well, we'll take a break at this point and resume in a few moments with the second half of this broadcast.
Let's return to the Mark Weber Report, brought to you by VOR. Hello and welcome back. Although Winston Churchill spoke out against the Soviet Union before and after World War II, during the war years he spoke cordially of the Soviet dictator. On several occasions he praised Stalin, repeatedly, repeatedly calling him his friend. On one occasion, at Yalta, at the uh, conference of the Big Three Allied leaders in early 1945, Churchill raised a glass to Stalin and said this, It is no exaggeration or compliment of a florid kind when I say that we regard Marshal Stalin's life as most precious to the hopes and hearts of all of us. I walk, walk through this world with greater courage and hope when I find myself in a relationship of friendship and intimacy with this great man whose fame has gone out not only over all Russia, but the world. Again, although he criticized Neville Chamberlain for a policy of so-called appeasement in 1939, Winston Churchill carried out a policy of far greater uh, appeasement, in fact, of sellout to the Soviet Union during World War II himself, to a dictator by every measure far more brutal than that of, of uh, the German leader. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the great Russian writer who was a prisoner in Stalin's gulag camps, has commented in this way, In their own countries, Roosevelt and Churchill are honored as embodiments of statesmanlike wisdom. To us, in our Russian prison conversations, their consistent short-sightedness and stupidity stood out as astonishingly obvious. Well, when Churchill became prime minister in May 1940, his first address in this new position was his famous blood, toil, tears, and sweat speech of May 13th. During that speech, he proclaimed his goal in the war, and I'm quoting, You ask, what is our aim? I can answer in one word. It is victory. Victory at all costs. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory however long and hard the road may be. Well, did those who thrilled at such defiant rhetoric fully grasp what this meant? Were they really willing to support victory, quote, at all costs? As it turned out, the cost was very high indeed. Because essential to Churchill's uh, policy during this period was that there should be and could not be any peace with Germany. Now, to those who want to regard the destruction of National Socialist Germany and of Hitler as worth any kind of price, that's what this would mean. But this meant that the war would go on until and resulting only in the destruction of Germany uh, without any kind of uh, effort to end the war in spite of numerous peace proposals by the German leader. During the war, Churchill made clear his simple aim in the conflict. He said, I have only one purpose, the destruction of Hitler, and my life is much simplified thereby. If Hitler invaded hell, I would make at least a favorable reference to the devil in the house of commons. Well, in keeping with that aim, Churchill refused even to consider Hitler's repeated offers of peace, thereby condemning the people of Britain and Europe to years of horrific warfare. During the war years, uh, the policy of Britain, America, and the Soviet Union was a policy of so-called unconditional surrender demanded of Germany and its leaders. But the question arises, um, those who defend Churchill insist that any kind of peace with Hitler was impossible because Hitler was so ruthless, so mad, that any kind of peace agreement with him was doomed and was uh, foolish. And therefore, the only policy with Hitler would have been one of warfare to the end. Well, is that really true? 
not only various historians have uh, come to believe that this was not true, Churchill himself, remarkably enough, admitted that peace with Hitler was in fact possible. In a conversation with Stalin in January 1944, Churchill revealingly said to the Soviet leader, and I'm quoting, I am sure you know that I would never negotiate with the Germans separately. We never thought of making a separate peace even in the years when we were all alone and could easily have made one without serious loss to the British Empire and largely at your expense, that is, largely at the expense of the Soviet Union. Now John Charnley comments, in sharp contrast to all those admirers who have strenuously denied that an honorable peace could have been made in 1940 or 1941, Churchill knew better. Peace could have been made. It would not have depended upon trusting Hitler, but rather upon the presumption that he would have been bound to come into conflict with Stalin. In other words, Britain didn't have to do anything dishonorable or harmful to British interests by accepting Hitler's repeated efforts to end the war in Europe and to come to peace. Hitler not only made numerous offers of an alliance before the outbreak of war in 1939 when Britain declared war against Germany, but after the conclusion of the Polish campaign in October 1939, Hitler once again reiterated his desire for an end to the conflict. And then when that was rebuffed by the British leadership, Hitler repeated an offer of peace after the fall of France in 1940 in a dramatic speech to the German Reichstag, which was followed up by diplomatic uh, feelers to Britain. Hitler once again offered peace. Perhaps the, most, the best opportunity for uh, ending the war would have been just before or just after the German attack against the Soviet Union in June 1941. And in fact, it was the desire for peace that motivated Hitler's deputy, Rudolf Hess, to make his ill-fated uh, solo flight to Britain in May 1941 to try to bring about peace between Britain and Germany. But again, all of these efforts were rebuffed and turned down by Churchill and by the British leadership, which meant selling out Eastern Europe to the Soviet Union, including Poland, and continuing the war that was so destructive for Britain and for Europe. One person who has commented on this is the um, Canadian writer Eric Margulis, who devoted a column to this whole issue entitled Churchill's Great Mistakes. He writes about the book by Patrick Buchanan, very well worth reading, entitled Churchill, Hitler, and the Unnecessary War. And Margulis, writing about this, says this, Churchill made the fatal error in World War II of backing Poland's hold on Danzig, even though Britain could have done nothing to defend Poland, Yugoslavia, or Czechoslovakia from Hitler's attempts to reunite millions of Germans stranded in these new nations by the dreadful Versailles Treaty. Britain's declaration of war on Germany over Poland led to a general European war. After suffering 5.6 million dead, Poland end up, ended up occupied by the Soviet Union. Buchanan's heretical view, and mine, is that the Western democracies should have let Hitler expand his Reich eastward until it inevitably went to war with the even more dangerous Soviet Union. Once these despotisms had exhausted themselves, the Western democracies would have been left dominating Europe. The lives of millions of Western civilians and soldiers would have been spared. In the end, Churchill and U.S. President Franklin Roosevelt were so obsessed with crushing Germany and so seduced by Uncle Joe Stalin, they handed half of Europe to the Soviet Union, a far more murderous and dangerous tyranny by an order of magnitude than Hitler's Germany. From his Soviet gulag cell, Alexander Solzhenitsyn called Roosevelt and Churchill stupid. Buchanan's book 
Margulis goes on, is important because we see some Western leaders making the same grave errors as in the 20th century and idolizing the arch-imperialist Churchill. The latest example, extension of NATO to Russia's borders. As in the case of Poland in 1939, the West cannot defend the Baltic, Ukraine, or Georgia and has no vital interests there. Yet NATO is giving the rulers of these nations the ability to drag them into a potential nuclear war with Russia. Have we learned nothing from the 20th century's apocalyptic wars, writes Margulis. As Buchanan says, Churchill's giveaway of Eastern Europe at Moscow and Yalta was a far graver blunder than Chamberlain's concessions at Munich in 1938. Buchanan's book strips away lingering war propaganda and shows the cynicism, lust for power, and foolishness of the saintly allied war leaders and their supposed good war. In the early 1950s, historian Francis Nielsen produced a stern portrait of the British leader entitled The Churchill Legend, which remains worth reading despite the passage of years. The British historian Nielsen wrote, Churchill had but one aim, only one desire. In The Grand Alliance, that is, uh, one of the volumes of his six-volume history of World War II, Churchill states, I have only one purpose, the destruction of Hitler, and my life is much simplified thereby. It is his life that is to be satisfied, writes Nielsen. England, Europe, are they merely the arenas that provide the accessories of the conflict? His life is to be simplified by throwing the world into chaos again. His purpose is the destruction of one man, and the last chance to maintain the culture of a thousand years must be abandoned because a politician's life is to be simplified. Another person who's uh, written about on this in a similar way is Alan Clark, historian and one-time British defense minister. He has handed down a similarly harsh verdict of Churchill's war policy, and I'm quoting, There were several occasions when a rational leader could have got first reasonable, then excellent terms from Germany. The war went on far too long, and when Britain emerged, the country was bust. Nothing remained of assets overseas. Without immense and punitive borrowings from the U.S., we would have starved. The old social order had gone forever. The empire was terminally damaged. The Commonwealth countries had seen their trust betrayed and their soldiers wasted. Victory at all costs, which is what Churchill pledged, also meant accepting the allied United Nations principles of egalitarianism and liberal democracy, which laid the groundwork for the dismantling of empire and for a massive influx of formal imperial subjects ushering in drastic changes in every area of life in Britain and in the rest of Europe in recent decades. In 1945, at the end of the terrible five-and-a-half-year conflict, Britain did not win. It merely emerged on the victorious side, together with the two great powers that really did win the war, Soviet Russia and the United States. A viable assessment of all of this was provided by the British writer Peter Millar. He wrote, and I'm quoting, The accepted view that his, that is Churchill's, bulldog breed stubbornness led Britain through its so-called finest hour to a glorious victory is sadly superficial. In no sense other than the moral one can Britain said to have won. She merely survived. Britain went to war ostensibly, to honor an alliance with Poland. Yet the war ended with Poland redesigned at a dictator's whim, albeit Stalin's rather than Hitler's, and occupied, albeit by Russians rather than Germans. In reality, Britain went to war to maintain the balance of power. But the European continent in 1945 was dominated by a single overbearing power hostile to everything Britain stood for. Britain hopelessly in hawk to the United States, had neither the power nor the face to hold on to her empire.
the evil genius bent on world conquest that most Americans believe Hitler to have been is a myth. The evil genius had more precise aims in Eastern Europe. A Britain that would have withdrawn from the fray and from all influence in Europe to concentrate on her far-flung empire would have suited him admirably. Well, it's to Churchill's credit that he acknowledged on at least one or two occasions the tragedy of his own life's work. During a dinner with close associates in early 1945, as his private secretary confided uh, to his diary, a rather depressed Churchill was saying that Chamberlain had trusted Hitler as he was now trusting Stalin, though he thought in different circumstances. Three years after the end of war, after the end of the war, Churchill wrote, and I'm quoting, the human tragedy reaches its climax in the fact that after all the exertions and sacrifices of hundreds of millions of people and the victories of the righteous cause, we have still not found peace or security, and that we lie in the grip of even worse perils than those we have surmounted. This is an extraordinary statement for Churchill to acknowledge that, as he puts it, we lie in the grip of even worse perils than we have surmounted, is an indictment of his own policy during World War II and of the policy of Britain in declaring war against Germany in September 1939. John Charnley, in his book uh, Churchill's Grand Alliance, uh, notes another example of Churchill's acknowledgement of the wreck and ruin of his policy. This was in early 1945, when Eden had ri ri written, Your policy is a sad wreck. Well, Churchill, he quotes, took a very gloomy view of events. And this is what Churchill said. This is in early 1945. The Russians were farther west than they had ever been except once. They were all powerful in Europe at any time that it took their fancy they could march across the rest of Europe and drive us back into our island. They had a two-to-one superiority over our forces, and the Americans were returning home. The quicker they went home, the sooner they would be required back here again. He, that is Churchill, finished up by saying that never in his life had he been more worried by the European situation than he was at present. Well, as Charmley points out, that never in his life was a pretty devastating indictment of his wartime leadership. Back in 1940, Churchill had proclaimed victory at all costs was his policy. Now it seems that what it had cost was everything. His long dealings with Stalin had failed to produce an Anglo-Soviet relationship, which filled him with anything except foreboding, and his long subservience to the Americans was equally failing to deliver the required result. The consequence of going to war against Germany and of refusing any kind of peace, any kind of settlement with Germany in those years, brought ruin, as even Churchill himself was to acknowledge, that outweighed any possible benefit. The continuing role that Churchill plays in the modern imagination is part and parcel of an entire view of World War II as the good war, a war between good and evil. Those people who defend Churchill's legacy and defend World War II as the good war are forced to ignore some central facts about the conflict. The One of those who has uh, written very uh, persuasively about the danger of our view of World War II is, as I mentioned, Pat Buchanan in his book on the Churchill legacy and about World War II, Ch Churchill, Hitler, and the unnecessary war. Pat Buchanan writes, There has arisen among America's elite a Churchill cult. Its acolytes hold that Churchill was not only a peerless war leader, but a statesman of unparalleled vision, whose life and legend should be the model for every statesman. 
To this cult, defiance anywhere of U.S. hegemony, resistance anywhere to U.S. power becomes another 1938. Every, every adversary is a new Hitler. Every proposal to avert war, another Munich. As a result of this, Buchanan goes on, American leaders are continually, repeatedly, referring to this or that um, leader that the United States of a country the United States doesn't like as another Hitler. This is not only untrue, it's a dangerous thing. And Buchanan goes on to conclude, and I'm quoting, This Churchill cult gave us our present calamity. If not exposed, it will produce more wars and more disasters, and one day a war of the magnitude of Churchill's wars that bought brought Britain and his beloved empire to ruin. For it was Winston S. Churchill who was the most bellicose champion of British entry into the European War of 1914 and the German-Polish War of 1939. There are two great myths about these wars. The first is that World War I was fought to make the world safe for democracy. The second is that World War II was the Good War, a glorious crusade to rid the world of fascism that turned out wonderfully well. Now, um, much of the image and uh, reputation of Churchill is based on prejudice, on hatred, and on ignorance. A good example of this is the uh, carefully cultivated image of Churchill presented by the British historian Paul Johnson. He's the author of a book entitled Churchill that's essentially a uh, part of the uh, idealization of Churchill and his uh, legacy. And Johnson writes, The fifth factor was Churchill's oratory. It is a curious fact that he switched it on to full power just as Hitler switched his off. Hitler had been in his time the greatest rabble-rouser of the 20th century. When Hitler marched into Prague in March 1939, it was his first unpopular act, Johnson writes. Thereafter, it was, he was ruling by force and fear. Sensing his loss of personal popularity, Hitler ceased to address the Reichstag or make any public speeches. By the time Churchill took charge, that is in May 1940, Hitler had retreated into his various military headquarters, mostly underground, rarely appearing and never speaking in public. He became a troglodyte, while Churchill became a world leader, ubiquitous in newspapers and newsreels, wherever Nazi censorship had no control. Well, this statement by Paul Johnson, who is a ardent defender of the popular view of Churchill, is just objectively untrue. It's absolutely not true that after May or June 1940, Hitler never again spoke in public. In fact, some of Hitler's most important and um, persuasive and effective speeches were made after that time, including a major one he made to a large rally in Berlin on October 3, 1941, a Reichstag speech he made in December 11, 1941, which is well worth reading, a large uh, speech he made to a very large gathering in January 1942, and a Reichstag speech he made in 1942 in April of that year. But this ignorance is typical of the uh, ignorance of not only Johnson, but of other defenders of this Churchill legacy. A legacy that, as Patrick Buchanan and others have pointed out, is a dangerous one, because if there's any learning from history, it has to be based on a truthful and accurate understanding of the reality of history, not the mythology. Uh, thank you for joining us for this broadcast, and I urge you to uh, uh, join us for the next uh, broadcast, and to uh, and I welcome comments and uh, letters and messages of criticism, support, and, uh, and of um, suggestions for future broadcasts.